Okay, I turned this on. You hear me all right? Well, good morning. Welcome back. And uh, some of you are new to the course, and others were with me last term. I started developing the course. I thought, well, I'm not even sure I'll be able to get five or six lectures in here. Now, of course, we're going on into the second term. And uh, I probably should mention this to Bill. I, I have in mind, maybe it might even extend in the ne into the next session. So I'll have to see and see if this hour is available. But one thing that uh, if, you're new to the, if you're new to the course, you know that I like to put a map up that you can look at as you're sitting around waiting for class to start and ask you to tell me what's going on on the map. And what I'm interested in here is the coloring. Why, what, what's the different shade, shading represent? I'm sorry? Time zones. The lines are drawn with the tri time zones, but, but how about the color, the shading? <laughs> well, I found this interesting. It's average bedtime when people go to bed. <laughs> and you do see the impact of the time zones, of course. And uh, if you look carefully, you'll see in the larger cities, in particular on the coast, people stay up later than they do out in the, the middle of the country, in the mountains. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. It was something I'd, I'd run across. So we'll talk about maps. This is all about maps, and we'll get into a bunch of uh, new things. But I thought it would be interesting, and in particular because many of you are here for the, for the first time, I'll go back and review a little bit of what we went over last time. And so here we are. Let me just a couple of comments initially. Uh, email address, feel free to contact me at any time. And uh, you can call me on the phone. And notes, uh, some of this has already been done. I appreciate Harold being willing to coordinate the course again. Uh, mute your cell phones. If you have special needs, then there's room up front. Uh, also. I'm, I'm happy for you to, if you feel the need to stretch, even as, as we're in the middle of a class, try not to disturb your neighbors, but feel free to stand up and walk around or leave the room if you need to. I'm pretty uh, informal about all of that. One thing, one problem I ran into last time, I like to send you emails and links to the slides that I post. And I'm using a Google account, and so I ran into problems. Uh, Google is pretty. Um, uh, careful about not, not wanting mass mailings, you know, for, for various reasons, not wanting people to, to send out uh, commercial spam and, and that kind of thing. So basically what I came up with, I was getting rejected by trying to send things out that way. And so I've set up a Google group uh, for this class, and it includes some of you signed up for that last time. And so what I will do is send you an invitation to this Google group. You don't have to have a, a Gmail account or anything. All you have to do is accept to be part of the group. And they're not going to track your locations and find out where you live from China and all that kind of stuff. So if you will just respond in the affirmative, if you want to receive links to the slides, then that seems to work pretty well. So just say yes. And then if you want to look at the slides later or not, I'll, I'll send messages to the class uh, through that method if I'm having uh, problems doing it by just direct emailing. Uh, let's see, what else did I put up here? It's continuation of last time. Uh, again, uh, caveat, be aware that I'll have internet links and the internet changes so every once in a while a link gets broken and what's supposed to show doesn't show and we'll try to get that figured out. Okay, recap from last time, just real quickly. And again, this is primarily for those of you who weren't here. Uh, talked about maps being everywhere. They're, they're all over the place. We see them here and there. Uh, I like this. This is a Mukator projection. Uh, this is perhaps the oldest map. And it doesn't look like much of a map. But the experts have been able to decipher that. And it shows some of the area around where this, uh, this mammoth tusk was found uh, going back about 13,000 years, so uh, it's quite old. A lot of early maps that we went through last time. Here's one uh, made of the ancient world uh, about 2,000 years ago. This is the one that really 
uh, persisted for a long time. It was done by Ptolemy, who was a Greek living in Egypt. And uh, it was really the most accurate throughout the Middle Ages. Now, what happened during the Middle Ages, a, a lot of the mapping reverted to something like this, which were just basically schematic diagrams with religious, um, re religious emphasis. They were referred to as TNO. And, and most often, they would have Asia at the top, Africa, Europe, and then, of course, the center of the world was Jerusalem or, or Palestine. And so it was more uh, an effort to express a religious point of view than anything related to showing accurate portrayal of the, of the earth. Uh, Sue, in the last course, uh, in the last class we were attending, mentioned uh, Ali Drisi, and this is one uh, in the Arab world. There were some who were trying to make accurate maps, and this is, this is one. And um, if, if you get up close to this, it's all written upside down because they made the, the map, you know, in the opposite configuration from what we're used to. We were talking in the last class about the Spanish and the Portuguese. Doe Henrique of Portugal, he was a prince. He became known as Henry the Navigator. He, he sent explorers out around the world from his school based at Sagres in Lisbon. And of course, the idea was to explore routes to the Far East. Trade had been interrupted across the Mediterranean. Here's Vasco da Gama going off and finally reaching India and uh, returning back to, uh, back to Portugal. And so they were opening up trade routes. So exploration was a prime motive for a lot of the map making and the exploring or in the, um, the overseas travel that was being done at that time. Of course, Columbus came across and coming to the west, looking for a route to the Far East, landed in the Caribbean made several voyages to the New World, and of course, given credit for um, discovering America. Well, there were other people who had been here previously. The Vikings, uh, John Cabot, or Giovanni Caboto, who was from Italy, sailing for the British crown, probably arrived long before Columbus. And so there were, there were others who had been in and about in this world. This is an interesting map that was purchased by the Library of Congress several years ago for $14 million. It's significant because it's the first map. It was done by a German cartographer who based his, um, his map on, um, on uh, some of the writings of Americo Vespucci. And it's the first map then to show the word America, which is shown here on the continent of South America. One thing that's even more puzzling about this map besides the fact that it names America, is that at that time, the, the, the Pacific Ocean was unknown. Balboa had not sighted the Pacific Ocean. So there's a real mystery as to how they knew South America was a separate continent instead of part of Asia and the Indies and areas on to the west. So, and, and as far as I know, that has not been resolved yet. I'll try to figure that out. Other people came along, made other maps. Mercator, I mentioned this last time. Uh, Lewis and Clark set off across North America exploring, and this is the map that was produced after they came back. Uh, maps became uh, quite decorative, uh, and in addition to becoming more accurate, of course. And, uh, and so you find maps with uh, a lot of pictures, a lot of symbolization showing different things. Sometimes the map was just basically a backdrop for other information that was being produced. This, of course, National Geographic did a lot of these sort of uh, informational pictorial maps that they included within their magazine. Uh, maps were made of different material. This one is from Polynesia with uh, sticks and seashells indicating different trade routes, uh, islands, wind patterns, wave patterns. Uh, talked all about this last time, showed you various maps where you have uh, cartoonish figures. This is one of my favorites with our president over here making faces at Europe. Brexit, they're leaving <laughs> in a boat. Uh, maps as art. Here's an ordinary topographic map that's been turned into a representation of a human face. Uh, this. Uh, a, 
if you were to get close up to this, these are all zip codes across the country. So all the zip codes and, uh, around the country are displayed on this, this map by this particular artist. Maps used for political significance purpose, for propaganda. This was a German map showing the danger that Czechoslovakia presented to the, to the Third Reich with all these airplanes attacking Germany. You know, you can imagine, of course, how that was misrepresentation. Fictional maps included in various novels. This was in Treasure Island maps of real areas that were being uh, described in fictional accounts and novels and books. Sometimes fictional areas, uh, Gotham City, which looks a lot like New York City. And uh, so the various fairy tales. Talked a little bit last time about cartography, the art of producing maps, traditional cartography, pen and ink drawing. Looked at maps as um, important tools, first of all, for navigation, the portal on charts. We use maps for navigation today, both aircraft, marine, um, nautical charts. Maps show information of various sorts. Here's a map that shows the various eruptions of Vesuvius and the outflows from that mountain over, the, over a period of several decades. Talked about various common types of maps. Topographic map, which is one of the most common, shows the terrain shown at various scales. And these are called seven and a half minute quadrangles because they cover seven and a half minutes uh, in degrees and longitude and latitude. They're also called topo maps because they include topographic isolines, and we'll talk more about those uh, in a little bit here. Highway maps, very common, mentioned geology maps, geological maps. It's a map of East Alabama, one of the most complex, uh, geologically complex areas in the, uh, in the nation. Soil maps, um, talked about that last time. Basics about maps, maps are really uh, collections of symbols. So you look at picture of the Earth taken from a satellite and compare it to a map, and you can see immediate differences. Maps generally, unless they're designed to do so, do not include the weather elements, but we do include features on maps that you would not easily see in reality. So the highway networks, uh, political boundaries, latitude, longitude lines, different coloration, this is all artificial. And basically what we do is we create maps by using points, lines, and areas as symbols to represent different types of features. So point symbols may be for cities, lines for roads, or latitude, longitude. And then area symbols here in this case would, be, would make use of color. The colors represent different things. Elevation on land and, of course, blue representative of water, which is uh, a common use of color on maps. Here's some more color representations and symbols. This is part of a topographic map of Auburn, Alabama. And uh, you can see the green represents usually vegetation, uh, some sort of tree cover. Red is standard uh, color on topographic maps for urban and built up areas. And on these maps, the purple is often used for updates. And so they won't make a new map, but they will update existing maps and use the color purple to show areas that have been uh, there that are new, newly uh, developed with houses and buildings, things, things of that sort. This seven and a half mineral and used a lot of standard symbols on maps. So various symbols for roads, different colors. Uh, again, here a little bit later, I'll talk about symbolization. We'll get back into that. Standard on most maps is some sort of scale something that represents the relationship between map distance and reality. And so here, we, if we take a, an arrow and trace from one point to another, and then we can lay that same arrow along a graphical scale down here at the bottom, that will tell us that that distance on the map is exactly equivalent to a half a mile, as shown by the graphical scale. This is also uh, computable by using the representative fraction. Representative fractions are also indications of scale, and what they mean is that one unit on the map is equivalent to 24,000 of the same units on the ground. So if you talk about if this is one inch on the map, but that inch 
is equivalent to 24,000 inches on the ground. So you just simply plug in the same unit on both sides of the little ratio, and you come up then with the, with the scale. Another thing that's common to maps is coordinate systems. And so the standard coordinate system used for showing locations around the globe is latitude and longitude. Longitude lines run north and south, and they're measured from the prime meridian around 180 degrees to the other side of the globe, and then 180 degrees in the opposite direction. Latitude lines run east and west. They're all parallel. Sometimes we refer to them as parallels. And the numbers range up to 90 degrees north, 90 degrees south. So the latitude and longitude lines are intrinsically different. You can't just flip them around 90 degrees and they do the same thing. No. Longitude lines are all the same distance. Latitude lines are all of different distances and they are parallel, whereas longitude lines converge at the poles. There are various other kinds of coordinate systems. I mentioned some of these last time. The UTM, Universal Transverse Mercator, it's the one that's commonly used in the military for various reasons. And it's a rectangular grid, and there are certain advantages for doing it that way, and we got into all of that last time. Also, the public land survey in the United States, a lot of the, a lot of the roads, a lot of the parcels, especially in areas out west, were laid out because of this land survey that was, that was done. And so we refer to the back 40 and uh, section lines, things of that sort. Another thing that we talked about last time a little bit was the whole business of projections. It's impossible to show the curved surface of the Earth on a flat piece of paper or a flat surface. And so you have to make some transformations. You have to do some modification to, to make it come out and uh, see what you're looking at. So there are various categories for projections. A conic projection looks something like, like this, where you wrap an imaginary cone around the sphere, and then you open it up and see what you have. Or more common are cylindrical projections. Notice that a cylindrical projection with the, with the, with the Earth, uh, as shown here, would show areas near the equator as, fairly, as being fairly accurate but you would have distortions as you move toward the poles. The greater the distance between the surface of the, of the projected uh, figure uh, and the, the actual surface of the Earth, the greater the distortion. So you get to the point where you will not even be able to show, on a typical cylindrical projection, you could not show the pole. There's no portion of this cylinder where the pole would actually, would actually appear. Uh, azimuthal projections, where you project on a flat surface, uh, a variety of other ones, polyconic are very common. So we went into a lot of that stuff last time. So basically that's sort of in summary. See, you didn't even need to show up last term. You learned it all right here in one fell <laughs> shoot. So that's, that's what we did last time. And uh, just to kind of recap, and this is more from our own, from our own thinking than uh, you need to to think about. So that's basically what we have done up to that point. I'll show you where I plan to go. We're going to start talking about data maps, mapping various kinds of statistical information in, in a variety of ways. I'll give you a couple of sample applications of spatial analysis that make use of maps. And um, you know we can talk about that. One thing, for example, that's very much in the news now is this is the spread of the coronavirus and the quarantine of uh, large portions of the population in China and all of that. Well, a lot of uh, epidemiology and disease uh, can, be, um, can make use of graphic spatial analysis and make use of maps. We'll talk a little bit about remote sensing, satellite imagery, aircraft imagery. Now we're using drones to fly around and look down at the Earth. A lot of new technology, computer, internet stuff, Google Earth. Uh, Google Earth is a free application. In fact, it's Google Earth Professional, which is, used to be for a fee, commercial, but now it's given out free. It has a lot of capabilities that are interesting to, to look into, and I'll show you how to use some of that. Uh, eventually, look at GIS, Geographic Information Systems, which is a large area unto itself. Maybe get into a little spatial modeling, so that's 
kind of my idea of where we might go this term. So we'll see how far we get and go as we go forward. We'll go back and look at coordinate systems for just a minute. Latitude and longitude is the standard way of identifying location around the, around the globe. You can identify any point on the surface of the Earth in terms of its latitude and longitude. Now remember, latitude is fairly easy to determine if you can look at the North Star, which sits above, well, way out above the North Pole, and uh, look at how far up above the horizon it is, then you get some idea of how far along this curvature you are, that angle uh, where, you, uh, where, where you look at, the, where you look at the, the polar star will give you the latitude, and you can deduce that. More difficult to determine la longitude. So last time, if you recall, uh, we uh, talked a little bit. Well, here we go. I was just going to describe. All right. So there you can measure that angle there will give you the latitude uh, of that position on the Earth. But with longitude, the best way to measure longitude is with an accurate clock. So if you have a clock aboard a ship out here in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and it's set to London time, you know what time the sun comes up in London, which is or at, more particularly at the Greenwich Observatory uh, on the prime meridian. If you know what time it comes up there, and it comes up at a different time, the sun rises at a different time out here in the middle of the ocean, that difference in time, if it's three hours later, that, can, that will give you how far around the, the circumference of the Earth you have, you have moved away from, from London. Of course, the, the problem was creating an accurate clock. Remember, they were putting clocks aboard sailing vessels. You couldn't have a pendulum clock. You know, the rocking of the boat would create havoc with that. And so uh, there was a long time in coming up with accurate clocks. And deserving of the honor of doing that was John Harrison, who was competing for a prize. Here are some examples of clocks he invented, many of them large. But the best was the last one, which was really about the size of a pretty good-sized pocket watch. And so he came up with that. So today, you can pull out your phone and identify the location where you are in latitude and longitude. And so here I did it just before coming into class. And this is on uh, Google Maps or Google Earth, one of them. And it tells me down here at the bottom that I'm standing right here in this part of the museum. I'm standing at 32 degrees, uh, and this is in decimal degrees, 32.5888088880 latitude and longitude, so I know exactly, exactly where I am. Now, one thing, if if you have to, uh, if you want to tell somebody what your position is on the surface of the Earth, this can be a little tedious. So suppose you know a fire breaks out in downtown Boston or somewhere. Well, you call into the call into the fire department and say, well, okay, I'm at latitude. 522, you know, so and so. Well, now with, uh, with our computers and cell phones, they could easily determine that. But not so common if you're in some ordinary situations. Let's say you're trying to find uh, somebody who's ill in, in uh, Calcutta somewhere. Well, it could be a little bit complicated. Well, Jean-Paul put me on to something last time, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show it to you right now. That's an interesting development. Again, we, get, we can get our location fairly easy from the modern technology we have, but what it came up with, what they've come up with is this. Have you ever struggled to find a friend? Had a taxi take you to the wrong entrance? A package delivered to the wrong address? Can you hear it? Or couldn't explain where you were? We developed what three words because addressing around the world should be better. And talking about a location can be really hard. Street addresses are often not precise enough. <clears throat> don't exist in parks, rural areas, or rapidly developing places. People struggle to find each other, and businesses fail to reach customers. 75% of countries lack a reliable address system, or suffer from no addressing at all. It's frustrating, costs the economy billions, and affects lives. What three words is the solution? A global address system made up of 57 trillion three-meter squares each identified by a unique three-word address. It's a 
simple as saying table map spoon to find a specific location on Earth. Three word addresses are precise, yet easy to remember. They can be written down, spoken, or shared by email or SMS. Easier words are in more populated areas, and addresses that sound the same are spaced far apart to avoid confusion. The whole service even works with flight, without the need for a data connection. And what we've done in English, we've replicated in many other languages, with plenty more to come. You can discover and share a free word address using our free app or online map. And partners in over 170 countries have integrated our code into their apps, tools and services. Logistics companies use them to improve deliveries, saving valuable time and money. Emergency services and aid agencies now locate people in need and coordinate support teams using three-word addresses. They're being used in mapping and navigation tools and by travellers and adventurers to locate hidden gems. Three-word addresses are being added to photos, contact details and social feeds. And the code is being built into the mobility and drone systems of tomorrow. Now everywhere has a three-word address. The most astonishing places, the most exciting places, and the places that need it most. We're helping to make the world a less frustrating, more efficient, and safer place. Three words at a time. Anyway, interesting, interesting concept. Uh, right now, I am standing at Original Soldiers Park. So you can go to that address, that, that three, three meter square location. Our son was traveling around and on New Year's Day he sent us this photograph. And the three word address for that location is Rehearsal Simulator Sleep. So I will give you homework to look up and see where they were. Or maybe you know, maybe you recognize where it is. So I'm not going to tell you, I'll tell you next time. Or if you want to, if you want more homework, find the three word location where you live the longest growing up. And you can go to simply what3words.com and, uh, and figure it out. Okay, we're going to talk about thematic maps, data maps of various sorts. Maps come in all kinds of, all kinds of uh, flavors and configurations and different ways of showing things. Talked about some of these already. Standard highway map showing road features, roads, lanes, streets, watersheds. Uh, physical maps here, they've, they've simply used some color shading to represent uh, the physical landscape of southern Africa. Here's just a standard political map showing the divisions within China, the different provinces. And uh, here's a geology map I showed before. So when you start talking about data of various sorts and making maps, then you have to think a little bit about classification. So you're all familiar with this. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and domain at the top. I had to add that because it didn't have the figure. And I don't know about you, but I remember memorizing certain uh, phrases to try to, so dear King Philip came over for good soup, was one I recall. This one's even better. Dumb kids playing cards on freeway get smashed. <laughs> that goes from D, domain, K, kingdom, phylum, class, order, and then species for smash. So we, we classify things in, in a variety of different ways, and that's important for map making because one of the things we do with maps, of course, is create categories of classifications to help us, to help us understand what's going on. Now, this is, a high, this is a hierarchical classification. It goes from big to small, a uh, lot to a little bit, to, top to bottom, you know, those kinds of, sometimes it's, it involves numbers, but not necessarily. But there's a lot of categorization that doesn't involve any kind of hierarchical relationship. One thing is not 
better than something else. It's simply different. So I give you an example here of uh, classification of different uh, video or movie genres. You know, there's nothing particular better about one. Well, maybe better. You don't want your kids watching it or something. But uh, the, in general, they are all qualitatively different. I don't know if you know this, but Netflix has hundreds and hundreds of different categories. I just copied a few of them here. The A's, and they just run all the way down to the Z's. And some of them kind of interesting. Uh, well, anyway. So you can, uh, if you were to sample something from each one of these Netflix categories, you would be spending a lot of time in front of your, in front of your TV set. But this is all, this is all, these are all qualitatively different. And the same thing happens to maps. So the map on the left shows, uh, I'm not even sure what the variable is, but there's an implied uh, increase of some sort. This might be a weather map of some sort. And maybe these are temperatures that get progressively colder as you go off into the, go off to the north. But the map on the right, these are NFL fans. You know, which area has the most, which team has the most, the largest fan base in a particular area. So this gray area here must be the Dallas, um, the Dallas team. Um, I would guess these are the New Orleans Saints, uh, Atlanta Falcons. And so those are just simply qualitatively different from each other. Yeah. The hierarchy would be big to small, first to last. And so many of the maps that we show have symbols that are qualitatively different. And we symbolize these in various ways. So we'll show a map that includes mountains, rivers. These are various kinds of features without a particular relationship. Now notice that there is some categorization in this. So if you, look at, if you look at roads, a lot of the roads, well, let's look at these. A lot of these lower level political boundaries are, are shown in red. Some of these are in, in black the, uh, as you move up the political hierarchy. And so line symbolization, which is all I'm showing right here, sometimes can make use of some classification within it. There's one thing that's important, and uh, just to talk about symbolization for a little bit, there are some standard conventions when you, when you use symbols, line symbols. So one, one standard characteristic of political boundaries is the higher in the political order you are, the higher in the, in the political hierarchy, the more complicated the line is, the more complex. So in an international boundary, notice that it's a dash with two dots and a big heavy line. A state boundary would be something not as, well, this is not really illustrating what I was hoping. Uh, but it still includes two smaller dashes. But as you get down to civil or county, the lines then become more simplified. Uh, it's important for the line to create some idea of what, it, what, the, what the line actually features. So the best example of that would be a, a railroad. Now, a railroad is a line with cross hatches on it. So it looks like a railroad with cross ties that you would see in the physical railroad. But unless it's a monorail, then a single line doesn't really show you a picture of a railroad. Uh, speaking of railroads, uh, I thought I'd show you. Generally, a railroad is created by a line and then having cross ties or cross hatches that you place along it. And as somebody who's taught cartography, first uh, manual cartography and then um, computerized cartography, you think, well, that's just a railroad, very easy to make. But not that simple. Because you have to, first of all, the baseline needs to be smooth. Railroads have uniform arcs and straight segments. And so you don't want little jiggly lines like you would have for a river, for example. And uh, the cross ties 
need to be uniform in size and uniformly spaced along the, along the line. They should be perpendicular to the baseline as much as possible, should not extend more to one side than the other. So again, as having taught cartography a lot, many of the projects I would get back uh, would be look like that. Because if you're making a long railroad, after a while you're getting tired and listening to your music and so on. And so anyway, just symbolization. But the main point here is to have the symbol actually represent reality as much as possible. Well, the first type of data map I want to talk about is what's called a choropleth map. And a choropleth map is something that you've all seen. It looks just like this. It's where the areas are polit usually political units, or they could be states or counties or census districts, zones, are colored or shaded according to some sort of variable. And the shading usually in, uh, reflects either increasing or decreasing values as you, as you move from darker to lighter shading in this fashion. So here, this map shows examples of water withdrawal. And the important thing is that the, the whole area is shaded dependent upon what the value of that area is. So there's a certain value for the state of Texas, and you then color in all of the state of Texas to represent whatever that value is for that particular, for that particular collection unit. Now you can map, using the choropleth technique, you can map just about anything under the sun. Everything is subject to being mapped, as long as it has some sort of spatial expression, has some sort of representation in space. OK, so here's a map that shows who ladies love in football. I, I have no word this come from. <laughs> well, well, anyway, it was. And so these are, now this is back in 2014, so Colin Kaepernick was still playing out in California. He's, I guess that was before all the political controversy. And so here, and this is determined by, I guess, the, the top selling female football jersey. Blake Bortles, which I didn't think was that, that great a player, played for the Jacksonville team. Uh, but you can see, uh, you know, Aaron Rodgers, that makes sense. But these, these areas now are qualitatively different. You know, there's, there's nothing numerical associated with any of these, any of these categories. And so this is an example of nominal data. Nominal data, then that's where things are qualitatively different. The best example are political maps, where we will color the different countries or the different states uh, based on their, their political associations of the various countries and are differentiated by, by different colors. And so, and that could be used at, at any level. It could be states, it could be counties, or, or anything. So there's no hierarchy or numerical relationship here between these different, these different areas. So here's an example of nominal data that's binary. What side of the road do you drive on? And you can see most places you drive on the left, except places that came under the British influence. And Japan, I guess. Japan, I don't know if they were. That was British or something else. But everybody else drives. Uh, well, I guess we drive on the right. They drive on the left. You know, we were in London last last summer or a little on. And you know, they've got all the all over the all over the city. They've got uh, signs painted on the sidewalk. Look right. Uh, I think that's what it is, isn't it? Look right, because that's where everything's coming from and stuff. Here's another one, binary. Well, what system do you use? Metric? No, we're in the minority now. We use something strange other than metric. Uh, and notice that only Thailand and you know what country that is? Liberia. Liberia. Why would Liberia use what we use? Because they were founded, they were established by returned slaves. You know sometime in the past. 
All right, again, here's nominal data. These are, again, different categories using different colors to represent certain va values. And this is a le leading cause of lost years of life. And you can see the various diseases down at the bottom. Heart disease, HIV, malaria, and heart disease pretty much universal as the primary reason why we die early. Here's another one, similar category. Uh, these are all qualitatively different. This is the second language in, in London. And it was interesting to me, a lot of Polish, more than I would expect. And of course, you can see the, the presence of people who have come from India and um, throughout Turkish enclave in the north, uh, Pakistan, Spanish and Portuguese downtown. So that, I thought that was a, an interesting, a lot of different ethnic groups, of course, in, in London. This says uh, favorite beers. <laughs> uh, Coors in Colorado, that's not surprising. And I don't, um, it, you know, you, you, you beer lovers would know more about recognizing the labels than, than I do. But, Is that Lone Star in Alabama? Uh, Lone Star, yes. Really? I don't know, what it, what is that? Okay, and here, here's a map. This, this doesn't relate exactly direct, but it's, it's a choropleth map of the historical evolution of Europe. And you see population over on the left, and the date up above, and the different uh, combinations and divisions of the political areas of Europe as time moves forward. So I'll let that... I'll let that run, and you can see increasing, decreasing. Now, some of these were, so they've got the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire was really more of a, a con conglomeration, confederation of a variety of different political units uh, with an umbrella emperor, but not, you know, I'm not sure you would call it a true political uh, nation state. See, early consolidation in France and England, of course. Uh, Spain emerges, Portugal, and so a good bit of stability in these areas. Notice that Germany and Italy are still not unified until you get into the, I guess, into the uh, 19th century. Large area occupied by the Ottomans that eventually fractures. And then as you move forward, you can see rapid changes. And if you look carefully at the dates, you can match those changes with important wars that were taking place in Europe um, at the various times. And that becomes especially evident as you move into the 20th century with the, the two world wars and the reshaping of the map of Europe during, uh, during that period. So notice Central Europe is still pretty well fractured. And until Bismarck and the Prussians take over in Germany, and um, then you get into the 1900s, the effect of the First World War, and consolidation in the Second World War, and again, complete reconfiguration. So anyway, I. That was kind of interesting, fairly stable since then. OK, let's take a break. We'll come back, and I'll pick up with this. One, one thing I wanted to mention at the beginning, and forget. OK, let Emily sit down, and then I'll start. <laughs> one, one thing I failed to mention at the beginning that I uh, I want to do is, if you're not on the uh, official roll, if you just walked in and want to sign up for the course, just write your name and especially your email address down at the bottom of the sheet. 
and I'll, after class, I'll go back and I'll collect those and add them to the list that I will then send out uh, notices about joining the, the Google group and everything. So, so if you want to receive the, uh, the information from the class and then look at the images, uh, make sure you get your name on a list out there at some point. Okay, one thing that I thought I'd just mention, not going to go into, and let's see, Jane Brown's in here. She could probably tell us more about this. The whole mathematical thing about the four-color map theorem. And that is you can color a map, again, with a score plot technique, by using no more, than, no more than four colors. In other words, you don't need more than four colors to ensure that every one of these areas adjacent to each other is of a different color. And I thought it was interesting that that was proposed a long time ago, but it wasn't finally proven until 1976. And I don't know how they, how did, how did they prove that? Did you use computers? So that's all topology, I guess, to get into that stuff. There's some restrictions on how things can actually touch each other. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, if, if you only have four color pencils, you want to make a map, you're in good shape. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you use five colors? Yeah. And um, the, of course, if you're, if you're using, uh, d depends on the kind of data. If you're showing these, this nominal data, qualitative difference, and that's, um, that's, that's adequate. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is it? Red and green, right? Uh, colorblind. I, I don't know, but I know that they don't perceive color yeah. the way you know most people but do. But you, you can see shades. See. Uh -huh. You can see shades, dark and lights, and that kind right. of thing. So you would be able to tell that difference. That difference. Okay. But there's a lot of things that they do that I see on the computer that my son that is severely colorblind, he's like, mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. Well, and you know, in the stoplights, they used to be red and green. Now they put some blue in it and all to try to make sure that people can differentiate those. When those. my grandmother lived, they had some really, when I was young, they had some really cheap stoplights. Stop uh -huh. Red was not always on the top. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> on light bulb. Okay. So from this direction, red would be on the top. From this direction, red would be on the bottom. So you had to be careful. Got a ticket. So he's colorblind. Uh, okay. The fourth color thing only works if you have just one contiguous country. Oh, is that right? If you've got like Germany and East Prussia used to be, uh -huh. it blows that up. So that messes it up. Okay. Well, I don't. I don't know enough about this math stuff. I'm gonna stick with geography. All right, well, here's, here's another one. Again, choropleth map, and what I wanted to show here is notice that you're beginning to get some categorization, some groupings, uh, some sorting out. So they'll have residential areas, and then they actually, on the legend over here, they make a separation and identify commercial areas, industrial areas, and to some extent, not, not done real well, but to some extent, the coloring of the map represents this classification. So this is not just pure nominal, qualitatively different, but these, these do break down in certain categories. So if you look at the map and you see purple areas, that generally reflects some sort of industrial, some sort of industrial reason, so region. So um, that's, that's also possible and something that you can do then with these, these types of, these types of choropleth maps. Uh, choropleth maps are used widely for representing interval or ratio data. And that's, of course, numerical data of some sort. And that you vary, it varies in quantity, intensity, you know, whatever the numbers are. And again, you want the shading or the coloring to be reflective of the trends of the data. So if you're going from light to heavy, then you want to go from maybe a light shade to a darker shade. You just want to make sure that that progression in, in the data is illustrated, is represented, the, the, the progression that you see on the map of the different shades and intensity of the color is representative of the way the data actually breaks down. 
Okay, so here, this, uh, this, this actually could be, uh, you know, back to the binary nominal data, although it's more cat. This is, do you love dogs or cats? I guess if you love lizards, you don't fit on this map. But, <laughs> but what, what is your preference? Interesting pattern, I guess, with the cat lovers more up in the north, dog lovers in the south. Maybe cats better at staying indoors, cold climate. I don't know. I've looked at this and try to come up with some sort of rationale for it. Uh, but the, again, the shading corresponds to the relative value. Here, there are two different colors and different shades. And notice that the colors indicate opposite trends. This is change in county population in South Carolina. And a loss in population is indicated by the bluer colors, and then the red would be places where it's increased. So a whole, a whole lot more increase than decrease. But again, the breakdown, the separation of the colors to show the different chin trends, and the stronger the trend, the greater the loss, the greater the increase, then the more intense the color, as opposed to a lighter, uh, less saturated color for the, uh, for the areas of lesser change. Here's another map, similar map of uh, Massachusetts, Connecticut, up in New England. And again, you can see increased population density as you move to darker shades. All right, here's a population map of Europe, similar kind of, sim similar kind of map where you color the whole area based on the data value. So countries with large populations, that would be West Germany. This was when they were, yeah, no, this is Germany. And Russia, they have the largest population. And uh, there's a problem with this kind of map, though. All right, notice how many purple areas. Purple is the lowest. Well, Iceland, not many people live in Iceland. And uh, let's see, Andorra. Uh, you can't see it, but Liechtenstein, Cyprus, Luxembourg. So big countries have more people, right? <laughs> so the map, the coloring on the map, it tells you that it's, and it is, in fact, showing total population, but really, what it's doing is confounding two variables. One is population, and the other is area. The bigger the area you have, the more people you're going to have in that area. So you, can't, you couldn't begin to cram 100,000 people or 100 million people into, and, into Andorra. OK, so illustrate those small areas. Well, here's another map. This is showing crime in Las Vegas. Uh, problems with this map, no legend. I don't know what those colors mean. You know, and again, I just pulled this off the internet. I'm, I'm hoping that this was picked up and posted by somebody who, you know, if you went back and traced it back, you could identify what the, uh, what the numbers actually represent. So you don't know. It says crime and incidents in Las Vegas. Well, are parking tickets crime or, you know, what, murders? And another thing here, this is absolute inc incidence of crime by zip code. You know, that's pretty evident. But again, you're getting the problem of confounding variables. You have incidents of crime, but these are the more heavily populated areas. And so you would expect to find more occurrences of criminal activity in areas where you have more people, right? And so you're actually mixing some things together. So in both of these cases, we've got this issue of confounding variables. In this case, the size of the country makes a difference. So you, you want to show population, but really you're showing uh, the relative size of the country by this coloration more than, than anything. And this is a very, very common occurrence, common problem when you look at choropleth maps, that people would just get some numbers, some data, and start mapping it using this technique. 
and without giving much thought into what they're really trying to represent or trying to show. So how would you take care of this? What would you need to do? You need to map population density. You have to, in other words, core plath mapping, you have to do a ratio or a percentage of some sort. So here's the original map of, of Europe. Here's a map of population density. In other words, how many people per square mile or kilometer or whatever the, the figure is. And it's a much more, it's a much more logical map than this one is. And so now, if you look at Russia, Russia actually has fewer people per area than uh, most of the other areas here in, in Europe. And so population density, in, in this case, you're mapping people per unit area, per square mile. And so when you do a choropleth map, you need actually two variables. You need the primary variable of interest, and then you need the second variable. In this case, you need area. What is the area of the areas that you're mapping in order to standardize that, to standardize that uh, data? So here in this case, density, number of people per square mile. All right, here's another map. This is, it says urban population. This is the total number of people living in urban areas for Africa. And again, you get something similar to what we were talking about. Though for smaller, smaller countries like Gambia are going to have fewer people living in urban areas. Here's the total population of Africa. This map looks a lot like this map. The more people you have all together, the more people you're going to have in urban areas. You know, so you really haven't mapped too much. This map, you think you're, you're talking about urban areas, urban population, but really you've made a map that just reflects total population, you know, the total number of people. Now, what we could do is, well, let me see what I have next here, okay. So there is a map that shows percent urban. Let me go back to this one. One thing we could do is we could standardize, like we did with the map of Europe, by total area and say, well, how many people per, per square mile? And that would make a much more sensible population map of Africa. And by sort of association would make a more sensible map of the urban population. But really, probably what you're interested in, if you're talking about urban population, you don't really want as much to know about how many people, how many urban people, that's people living in cities, per square mile, as you want to know what percentage of that total population is urban, right? So not how much per square mile, as what percentage of the total population is urban. So in this case, rather than standardize by area, like we did for Europe, how big the country is, you'll want to standardize by total population of that country. How many urban people per total population? What percentage of the total population lives in cities as opposed to rural areas? Is a much, that's probably what the author is trying to show here. And so that's what this map is. That's percent urban. And here you get a, a feel for how many people live within the cities. Now, to be honest, I don't really know exactly why these maps were made. Maybe there is some reason, something, you know, as part of an article or something that, where this is exactly what it wanted to show, but not necessarily. It's my guess that this would be a better map to represent what we're showing. And in this case, you're looking at urban population as a percentage of the total population. So again, if you're doing choropleth maps, you need to do you need to do two things. You need to, map, you need to think about the primary variable of interest, in this case, urban population. And then you have to give a lot of thought to the secondary variable, the standardizing variable that you're going to divide through by and get the percentage that you're interested in. All right, so there's urban, there's urban density. And you see, you get a very different map. And maps then convey information. This conveys really quite different information from the one on the left. OK, here's a similar kind of issue, similar kind of problem. Total population, this is the Bay Area up around Boston. 
and I guess these are all zip code areas, perhaps. And you can see the coloring, the shading associated with total amount, total population. Uh, here is population by area. And again, much more meaningful map. Here you see population density and highlighted just a couple of areas to show how the color changed when you look at the density as opposed to the total number. So here's a, an area that has a lot of a pretty good number of people, but they're spread over a large area. So up here now it shows up as being a lighter color, lower density. And you see the greater densities then down in the, the central area. And um, simply because these areas in the suburbs and outside of the main core area are much larger and going to include larger number of people. So anyway, keep that in mind. If you ever do mapping and think about uh, looking at these kinds of maps, these choropleth maps, uh, make sure that what you're looking at is some sort of ratio percentage over here in the legend. You don't want to look at absolute total numbers. OK, so here's another map. And here again, this is a better map than the one of Las Vegas, violent crimes by neighborhood. This is number of, um, let's see, I guess that's number of, <coughs> number of criminal activity, uh, criminal events per 100,000 residents in each one of these areas. This is a Chicago area. So again, look at the base number. Similarly, now here we're looking at uh, percent of people over 65 years old. Again, this would be standardized by the total population. Um, and most commonly, total area, total population would be the standardizing variables, but not necessarily. I'm trying to think of, a, of an example. Let's say you're, you're interested in the number of orthopedic surgeons in an area, and you want to map that. Well, you might map number of orthopedic surgeons per square mile. But, you know, I'm not sure that would tell you too much. Number of orthopedic surgeons per total population, but perhaps a better measure that would give you a more meaningful map looking at the concentration of this particular medical specialization would be number of orthopedic surgeons per total medical professions, professionals or doctors or surgeons in general, you know, something of that sort. So again, that standardizing variable would be different from some of the ones that we've been talking about. But anyway, main thing, make sure you're looking at density. People uninsured, uh, under 65, all races. OK, so uninsured people are more common. Uninsured are more common down south than up north. This was interesting. This is percentage. This is an 1860 outbreak of the Civil War. And what percentage of the local population was made up of enslaved people? And so very dramatic concentrations, coast of South Carolina, the Black Belt of Alabama, the Delta region in Mississippi, uh, and as high in some cases, 70 to 100 percent in some of these darker areas. Mm -hmm. If we track Jim Crow, I bet it would be yeah. very related. And that's, that's one of the, and we'll get into all of this, one of, the, um, one of the interesting things to do is to compare patterns, and you can compare them visually, but you can also compare them numerically, mathematically, in terms of associations. So you get interesting correlations and regressions by doing that sort of thing. OK, so here's share of young people aged 25, 35 living with their parents. Uh, I know a lot of cases like that. That seems to be more common in Scandinavia than areas of Eastern Europe. Oh, I have it backwards, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. OK, yeah. 
So I guess in Scandinavia, you move away from home early. Thank you. And, by, and for comparison, the United States, 13.9. Let's see, what is this? Uh, average age of principal farm operators. So farmers, how old are they? And you can see areas where the, the farmers are older. A little bit surprising to me. I would, have, I would have thought maybe some of the plains and Midwest areas where a lot of people have moved away from the farm. You might have uh, some of the older populations out in, in those areas. That could be principal farm operators. That could be daddy on the farm and the boys work on it. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah, you'd have to go back and see exactly how the data were derived. And, you know, I didn't take the time to do that. I just thought the map was interesting. But at least this one gives you a reference, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and you could probably track it back and eventually see, you know, they'll have metadata information, things that tell you where the, where the data come from. Uh, okay, well, here's just a general core plant map. I think I've already made this point. What you want to do is make sure that the shading is representative of the trend in the data. So if you look at a map like this, don't say anything about what it is. The implication of that map is that these, whatever the map is, the colors represent uh, areas that are qualitatively different in some way, that there's no implied um, interval or, or relationship, or hierarchical relationship among, among the data. Well, when you get into core plus mapping, there are several things to consider that uh, are critical. One is the classification scheme. So here, I'm mapping population. I'm not doing, somebody else did. Population density of Ohio, they are using a density value. And they have created five categories and I won't go into exactly the, the numbers here. But you can see that very few areas, the area around Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, I guess, show up dark, but everything else is very light colored. Now here they have gone and created some natural areas where, where you look at a data distribution and you see breaks in the data distribution, then you try to create a break at those places where you have fewer, const fewer occurrences of the data that you're looking at. Another common practice is to use quantiles. And what quantiles means is you take the total data, the total number of counties, and if you want five categories, you divide up whatever, however many counties you have and ensure that one-fifth of all the counties show up in each category, you know, and break the, divide the data and, in that way. And so that's a common practice. A uh, little bit difficult to, to interpret the legend when you do that, because you might have just a small gap between one shade and another, and then a great big gap here among the others. And then you can create various complicated geometric or logarithmic progressions in your, your data. And so the point I want to make here is that the same data depending on how you divide these categories, how you break this out, can be shown, can make very different looking maps. And it can create different impressions in the mind of the reader when you, when you play around with these sorts of, these sorts of numbers. So cho choosing that range, that break, is important. Here's another example of this sort of thing. So here are crude birth rates in the United States. And uh, you see that map, and again, the, the categories. And it suggests that the rates, you see a lot of white areas. So that gives impression that the rates are low. You could create different breaks here, though. And it would imply very high birth rates. Again, all based on the, the way you divide and break up these, these different uh, range intervals. Sorry. Same kind of thing here. Yeah. One of the problems I have uh, with maps like this, mm -hmm. including the, the one previous one, the Ohio map with the various shades of blue, is that, and I understand we're looking at it on screen rather than on, in the actual page. Right. It might be clearer. But so often, to my eye, uh, two of the categories are more sort of run together so that mm -hmm. uh, you can't really differentiate. 
differentiate very clearly, for example, between the, uh, right. mm -hmm. the two darker categories look exactly the same to me. Yeah. I understand mm -hmm. we may have an interpretive problem when we look at that mm -hmm. on the screen, but even even on, on a, in a book or on a page, sometimes I have trouble with that. Yeah. It may be just my aging eyes. No, it's not. That that's that's an important area in cartography is learning how to try to create categories that had that are visually distinguishable from each other. And they in general the theory is that if you get beyond five, six, perhaps seven at the most, even using color, you're going to have our perception is going to be it's going to be very difficult for us to perceive different tonalities in these areas of the map, which kind of defeats the purpose of creating the different shadings on the map. Now, what they will do, and again, this gets into uh, psychology and perception, it's much easier to distinguish between, let's say, a pure white area and an area that is slightly gray. So let's say an area that's pure white versus one that is 5% shaded will show up distinctly to your eye. And similar, one that's perfectly black and one that is maybe 95 or 90 percent shaded. So you get, you can perceive that difference much more clearly than you can, let's say, within these mid ranges where you have something that goes from 45 to 55 percent. You know, and that has to do with the way we simply perceive, you know, the way our eyes work and our brain works. And so there's a whole area within psychology that has to do with this study of perception and how you would, and so if you're, if you're really being serious about making these sorts of maps, then in creating the shading, you want to ensure that you have a smaller gap between some of these border areas than you do in the, in the central ranges. Now what happens with a lot of contemporary mapping is there are computer programs that sort of uh, have standard default action. And so you say, well, I want five categories, and they'll just break it in 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100, you know, that kind of, that kind of breakdown. And that creates a map that, that gives uh, poor perception distinction among the various, the various categories. So you have to sort of tweak those, those kind of things. And um, again, that, that gets into the whole business of knowing what you're doing as opposed to just punching numbers on a machine and, you know, letting it, letting it do the work. But you're exactly right on, on that point. Yeah, Bill. So the choice of these number values over each block, mm -hmm. uh, that, that would imply that in no state was the break ever higher than never got to 22 or was never lower than 10. Yeah, that's, uh, that's true. And then that gets into some other issues about, well, is the way this legend is established, where would, let's say you had a value between, uh, a value of 19.65, where, what would the color go for that one? You know, I mean, in, in terms of number theory and so on, there's, there's no way to represent that, that particular value given the way you've divided the shading up here. So that gets into some other kinds of theory, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so you, you can use color, you can use patterning, that would be cross hatches or squares or, uh, and again, I should have put some examples of this. If you look at, um, a lot of times geology maps will make use of, of different patterns. So limestone looks, has some, some blocky looking things and then you have cross hatches for something else. And, so with the same kind of tonality, you can create uh, distinction among the various, the various areas. Yeah, thank you, Marilyn. That's a good point. Uh, okay, well, let me just go ahead and show you a couple of really bad maps. All right, first of all, it says population. Same thing we've been talking about. Uh, this should be density values, but it's not. It's total values. Now, what happens with the, the U.S. states is Many of them are about the same size, Texas a larger, Delaware a smaller, but uh, you do get a little bit of a representation, but then the color scheme just doesn't make any sense either. Uh, so I guess white, it's appropriate to be 
lower values, dark would be higher, but that's just uh, kind of gets on my nerves when I see a map like that. Okay, here's another one that I pulled off. Uh, most and least din dangerous counties in the United States. All right, number of crimes. Uh, what kind of crime? You know, again, is this uh, some sort of crimes per per area? I mean, is, is that the number of the color here? In, is that the number of cri criminal events in Lee County per year, per month? What is it? Doesn't tell you anything. The one thing that's of interest in this map to me is the the borders between the states show up dramatically. So that implies to me that whatever data they were using was collected differently, or there was something about the you know the publication or whatever data they used that made uh, the made the the patterns come out differently. I, it's not. I can't imagine somebody in this area in southern Tennessee has a different criminal behavior from these people here in North uh, Mississippi. So. Well, they're no, they're no crimes if you live online. Yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> okay. Well, let's see what else I have here. Okay, basic problem with core plots. I haven't even mentioned this yet. Is, is this. All right, this, this is just straight population. And we will assume that it's population density. In fact, it is population square mile. As you drive from West Florida into Southern Alabama, in reality, does the population density change that much? OK, it doesn't. So what you look at here is these are artifacts of the way data are collected. Uh, you know, you collect data. In this case, we're representing it, representing it by state. And so you don't, as you move from one state to another, fall off a ledge here. You know, jump or fall off. Or you, go from, um, you go from California to Nevada. In this border area, you don't have this dramatic transition. What you do is you have big cities over in Western California that create the, the higher population values. And the other side of the coin is that across the states, you don't have uniform densities. So you look at Texas, and it looks like everything's the same all the way across the state. Well, this now it's necessary because of the way we collect data, but nevertheless, it gives you a faulty impression of the way things are really distributed. So one of the things cartographers do, and people who analyze this stuff, is, is well, let's see if there's some ways of making it a little bit more, con make it conform to reality a little bit more. And so we have some other techniques that we'll use. OK, well, we're about out of time, so this is a good place to stop. Let me see if you have questions about, about any of this. Anything? Yes. Right. And so, you know, the smaller the area, the more exact, more. But, but nevertheless, you still have the theoretical problem of, OK, make it to the brown bag, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you.